That is the $64 question. That's the big question. And it's, uh, or at least one of the big questions, that's causing a lot of controversy right now. There is no answer to that. There was a lawsuit in California, in the United States, when uh, a man sued a doctor for using his tissue as part of a series of genetic experiments. Did the uh, DNA belong to him, or was it the common heritage of humankind? Those questions are becoming more and more important uh, and have to be dealt with, so those ethical and moral and legal kinds of questions. Solving those kinds of problems is infinitely more difficult than, than splicing DNA and, and, uh, and decoding the human genetic code. It's, it's the moral and ethical and, and legal implications of who owns the genome, who does it belong to. Those are the real sticking points. Right. Thanks, Joel. Any medical breakthroughs from the Human Genome Project will require a long testing process to make sure they're safe. But should the testing be done on humans? Do you care about side effects if you're dying? Those kinds of questions are being asked more and more urgently, especially in the fight against AIDS. And once again, it's an issue that science fiction has examined. Do I think that the United States will have to relax its, its um, testing controls? Yes, I do. Because not only AIDS, but we are making some significant strides in cancer cures, which are going to be very controversial and untested. And I think that there will have to be a lessening of the usual kinds of controls for people who are or very easily could be terminal. Right. On their own choice, of course. They will have to voluntarily choose to participate. But I think we'll have to allow this just because both the medical breakthroughs, as in the case of cancer, and the political pressures, as in the case of AIDS, are going to force it. Does that open the stage to some massive tragedy? Yes. And in fact, the story that I have just finished, um, which is called Dancing on Air, has to do with the future of what I've called bio-enhancers, tiny little n based on nanotechnology. And there is, it turns out that there's a, a terrible unseen, because genes are tricky things to fool around with. There's a lot of redundant coding mm -hmm. that comes down uh, at the end, on, or almost the end, on, on some of the characters. And that could very well happen. We could allow a cure for AIDS, we could allow a cure for cancer, and it could turn out to make the situation worse. Nancy Kress mentioned nanotechnology, which is a hot topic in science fiction. The nano refers to size. A millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, a micro is a millionth, a nano is a billionth. Hey kids, if you like micro machines, you'll love nanotechnology. Miniature machines from molecular mechano. Gadgets so small they can make a fantastic voyage through your bloodstream. Feeling fat? Well, teensy tanks can kill cholesterol. Sinuses block, send in a steam shovel. Fight a fever with an itty fire engine. Overcome impotence with an infinitesimal erector set. Dead? Revive the non-alive with atom-sized assemblers. And best of all, nano machines are self-replicating. Buy one, get a trillion free. Nanotech, it's a mega trend. The last big trend in science fiction, cyberpunk, came and went kind of quickly. Does nanotechnology have more staying power? I think it has in large part because nanotechnology is actually a term that's been taken in from, um, as it were, descriptive or projective um, science, whereas cyberspace, cyberpunk, was a description of a, of a literary attempt to understand part of the computer-dominated world. So the focus is very different. Nanotechnologies are going to exist whether or not science fiction does, and cyberpunk did not exist without SF and will not exist without SF. It was a, a literary movement. So very, very different. It's interesting that the so-called godfather of the cyberpunk movement, William Gibson, has started including nanotechnology in his fictional futures. As I expected, virtual light is packed with cutting-edge information technology, especially virtual reality. But you also included nanotech as a background element. Why was that? Oh, probably because I find it so creepy and, and unthinkable. I think the only person who's been able to uh, really get close to that stuff, I think, the only writer who's, who's come close to really dealing with that stuff, of course, is Greg Bear. Who, who had an early lock on it, you know, he, and, but, you know, when I read Eric Drexler, it just gives me the willies. I mean, talk about apocalyptic. Here's this, it's this guy saying, well, you know, and uh, give me 20, give me 20 years here in the lab, and we'll all be immortal. 
There won't be any money. Nobody will have to worry about any of that stuff. By the way, we won't be remotely human, and we won't even be particularly shaped like anything, but don't worry. And, and anyway, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so I just, I, I find that kind of, there's something kind of, in a way, almost heartwarming about that. It's, it's such a kind of pure mad scientist riff. And, and I used it in virtual light to suggest something. There's just sort of this other level of technology that's kind of circling out on the rim of things so that, so that the characters in virtual light are dealing with all this VR technology and, and big databases and all of that are occasionally sort of glancing over their shoulder at something and just kind of thinking, oh, I don't even want to think about that. I, I just don't know what that's going to be. The thing about nano it is you can do anything with nano. It's basically the new magic of, of science fiction. Um, and I, I like it in that regard because I'm not really, I'm no rocket scientist. I'm, I've said before I'm in the dreams and nightmares department in science fiction. I'm not the, I'm not the rocket scientist guy. And so um, once I understood it, I just uh, started like dreaming up little things to, to do with it and, and it seemed like a, a way to extrapolate without having to do a lot of research. Right. But even though you described nanotech as the new magic, was it important to you to believe that it might someday be capable of doing all the miraculous things that it does in Warpath? Yeah. Well, I want to stay within, like, I mean, the thing about science fiction is it is a form like the sonnet is a form, the genre is a form that you write within. And part of the thing is it needs plausibility. And so it's important to me to make it believable right. any way I can. You know, and part of that might be research, part of that might just be making a really good metaphor and comparing it analogous to something else. And so the main thing is to make the reader believe it more than th that it be true. So how soon do you think we'll have these sort of self-repairing houses that nanotech has made possible in your novel? I hope soon, because I sure would like to, to um, have my bus be cleaned up by little nano machines instead of me having to swab it down all, every time I invite people over. Why did you link nanotech and dinosaurs in the Barsoom project? Well, um, I needed a mechanism to create dinosaurs. Mm -hmm because I wanted to have uh, some dinosaurs for, for a couple of particular se sequences. Um, bonsai dinosaurs, uh, dinosaurs that a person was entering through a sort of a neural link virtual technology so that they could experience the limbic sensation of dinosaur mating. Um, and then I also wanted a unique assassination tool in another time. So nanotechnology fit into several different possible things um, and became the link between the a particular image system that I wanted to use and the technology which made it possible to create it. I mean, there are only so many ways to bring dinosaurs back, you know. Right. How did you research nanotech? Oh, engines of creation, you know, uh, mostly, and uh, uh, talking to friends who are more familiar with it than I am. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make certain that the things I had it doing were possible for it to do, and once I was certain of that, it's like, okay, I'm just going to have fun with it now. Because the truth is, we don't really know how it's going to work. As long as it's internally consistent, that's all that really matters. Uh, but it has to be internally consistent. A fantasy only has to be internally consistent. Science fiction has to be externally consistent too, to a, a degree. So I could not contradict what we know about it. But then again, since we don't have nanotech yet, there's a lot that we can't possibly know. So you can get away with a certain amount. Ian, in your upcoming novel, Necroville, why are you tackling nanotech? The whole idea for the book came from a comment Ian Watson once made. He said, the first, the first corollary of nanotech is everyone becomes immortal. And thinking that, I thought, well, not immortal, but perhaps the dead could be resurrected by nanotech. Uh, the actual nano, nano agents, or as I call them, tectors, replacing each cell in the body, in fact, would recreate the person, but in fact, the person, in a sense, dies and is rebuilt. And the idea is, what would this alternate society of the dead be like? Um, if you're dead, you don't have any legal rights to anything. I mean, dead people don't own property, dead people don't vote, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, there would be a kind of subcast of dead people forced to work, in a sense, for nothing, for the living. Um, a parallel, in a sense, of a kind of apartheid living dead. Um, the, the possibilities of nanotech are endless, really. Uh, it was something I touched on slightly in the story, Listen, but I'm now coming back to 
hopefully with a vengeance for the Necroville project. 